It's glitchy. Testing, testing, is it working? Okay. Okay, we're ready to go, I think. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the business meeting for March 30th, 2021. And uh, we do have a quorum. All three commissioners are present. And at this time, uh, Chris, would you like to lead us in the flag salute? Yes, Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, would you like to, lead, to read the Zoom guidelines, please? Sure. This meeting is streaming via Zoom and Facebook and YouTube Live as well. For those meeting in person, please remember to turn on your mic and speak directly into the mic when talking. For those joining us via Zoom, please remember to mute your phone or device when you are not speaking. If you forget to mute your phone or device, we will mute you. You will hear a voice saying you have been muted, and if you hear that voice, it is because we could hear your background noise. For questions during the meeting, please raise your hand. If you are not able to raise your hand, please wait until the commissioners ask for questions. Okay, and again, I'll remind everyone, if for those on Zoom, if you cannot hear or something happens electronically, uh, make sure that you get our attention. We will stop the, the hearing or the uh, the meeting immediately so we can uh, fix whatever we need to fix. Uh, first off, uh, we have public comment, but I'm going to remind people, I know that we have a hearing today, uh, and you will have time to uh, uh, to address, ask your questions for clarification and make statements during that time. However, you are more than welcome to... Uh, to, uh, you know, if you have public comment at this point in time, and you have three minutes. And we have no one signed up. Do we have anyone? None? Okay. Okay, with that, I guess we'll move on then. So we will be adding to the agenda resolution 21-125 regarding the emergency closure of Sirius Hill Road to all through traffic. And move to approve resolution 21-117. Second. Okay. There was a motion point, as... Point of order, sorry. Um, first we would, if it's okay, go ahead and add that resolution and vote on adding it to the agenda. That, the 21 dash. One, one two five. five. One two five. Move that we add resolution twenty one dash one two five to the agenda. Second. Okay. A motion was made and second to approve resolution twenty one dash one two five. That's the regarding the emergency closure of Cirrus Hill Road to all traffic. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passed. Thank you. Make a motion to approve resolution 21-117. Second. Okay. There is a motion and a second to approve 21-117. Is 
That's for the hearing of notice for the 2021 budget. Do we have any uh, comments? Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Becky Butler here speaking to resolution 21117 on the notice agenda. The notice of hearing regarding the second budget amendment for 2021. All those wishing to provide public comment remotely will have access to the meeting online through Zoom. Written comments can also be submitted by mail at 351 Northwest Northwest North Street, Chehalis, Washington, 98532, or email at bocc at lewiscountywa.gov. Please include public comment, budget amendment, and the subject line. Notice of the public hearing will be published in the Chronicle on April 1st and April 6th. The hearing will be held on April 13th. The notice pertains to all funds and reflects a revenue increase of $24,064,511, an expenditure increase of $17,631,613 for a change in fund balance of $6,432,898. Additional funding notifications received from this point until the hearing will be noticed on the hearing at, on the 13th. The general fund portion, which is also included above, uh, is a revenue increase of 15,000, an expenditure increase of 35,230, and a change in fund balance of 20,230. The most significant amendments include the estimated direct funding from the US Treasury that was included in the American Rescue Plan, funding and expenditures for mass vaccination sites, and capital project costs related to the 2021 bonds for the juvenile renovation and general administration buildings. Any questions? Hey, thank you, Becky. Okay, no questions. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Move to approve, uh, sorry, the warrants payroll and our meeting minutes. Second. Okay. Good afternoon, Commissioner Suzette Smith, Chief Accountant to Auditor's Office, here to present to you resolution number 21-118. This is a weekly approval of warrants against the various county departments. The first series is listed as a skip in sequence. These warrants were issued on behalf of the special purpose districts. They were numbered 839-651 through 839-679. Warrants issued on behalf of Lewis County include series 839, excuse me, 680 through 839938, 259 warrants for a total of $682,869.54. In addition, we had payroll on March 25th. The warrants were numbered 795-815 through 795-821. And automatic deposits were number 23852 through 24422 for a total of 578 combined automatic deposits and warrants. Total dollar amount, $1,052,661.99. Any questions? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Suzette. So there was a motion and a second to approve two consent items. First one is approval 21-118, that's approval of warrants. And then the second one is approval minutes for March 23rd, 2021. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass. Thank you. Make a motion to approve nine del- deliberation items. Resolution 21-109, resolution 21-110, resolution 21-119 through resolution 21-125. Second. Okay. Chris. Good afternoon, commissioners. Chris Panish, director of uh, HR in the county. Uh, I'm here to speak on resolution 21-109. This is uh, the, the Lewis County hired an outside uh, salary consultant to comp- complete a comprehensive classification and compensation study for current county positions uh, last year. And this resolution will approve the placement on the uh, of the non-represented, non-union employees on the new grid, effective April 1st. Of note, there was a clerical error on the documents that we submitted earlier. Uh, one position was omitted, but has been added uh, since uh, we, uh, as of now, and it's also noted in bold. If there's any questions on that resolution? Okay. 
I'm here also to speak on resolution number 21-110, which is the placement of represented employees on the same, based on the same study. The uh, represented groups include AFSME, Teamsters, representing the assessors group, the combined group, juvenile detention group, juvenile probation, uh, PA clerical and supervisors, as well as the SSS guild. Are there okay. any questions? Any questions? Also, if I may, I'd like to recognize Megan Eastman, who's been the project manager on this for the last six months, done a tremendous amount of coordination, not only with the salary consultants, but a lot of the offices and directors. And uh, I think she's done a pretty great job. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank your entire staff. I know there was uh, many, many hours that went into this and thank everyone for um, really getting involved with this to make this uh, work for everyone. Thank you. So thank you. Okay. 21 Once again, good afternoon, good afternoon, Commissioners. This is Suzette Smith to present to you resolution number 21-119. This resolution will establish the special revenue fund titled the American Rescue Plan. The fund number will be 1420 in the county's general ledger. With the recent legislation being signed by President Biden, Lewis County is set to come into quite a bit of money that they will be spending uh, related to this American Rescue Plan. There are many restrictions on this funding source, and we want to be able to track this funding and the spending of it appropriately in the general ledger. Therefore, we are requesting to establish the Special Revenue Fund 1420 in order to track the funds of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Are there any questions? So that uh, in the last uh, uh, plan, also we set up a special fund. Is that is that correct, Becky? Yes, we established okay. uh, 1410, the COVID-19 response fund. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon again. Speaking to resolution 21120 on the agenda, approve an agreement with OpenGov for software services. Um, the BOCC is committed to open and transparent government services and will continue to approve the county website to offer more government documents and updates online whenever possible. With the direct payment of the American Rescue Plan funds coming direct to the county from the U.S. Treasury within the next two months and being spent over the next four years, this tool will assist in providing transparency in the use of funds and allow for public engagement as the BOCC allocates fund to projects within the community. OpenGov is also a budgeting and planning software solution for budget process automation, personnel for cost forecasting, reporting and public transparency, driving more effective planning. Once this is set up and complete, a software will be linked to the MUNIS ERP system, uh, pulling in the county budget and financial data to create user-friendly reports and dashboards available internally and to the public on the county website. OpenGov's data portal will provide county government officials access to financial data to make informed decisions, share data with the community and increase community involvement in the budgeting process, as well as provide county offices and departments the opportunity to share their work with the public in the form of stories. Using a web-based interactive platform that is both easy for staff to create content and equally easy for the public to receive and understand that information. The software will provide better access to our annual budget with additional context behind the budget decisions and how taxpayer dollars tie back to our strategic plan. The agreement with OpenGov is in the amount of $385,890 for the term of five years to be paid in accordance with the contract. And this author authorizes the county manager to sign this agreement. Once approved the BOCC, by the BOCC, county staff will begin working with OpenGov the 1st of April to outline the project timeline and hopefully have this implemented by the end of the year where we can start creating those budget documents online for the for the citizens to access. Any questions? I just want to add that Becky and I have been working with OpenGov folks for over a year now, probably close to a year and a half. And, um, you know, they've been they've been absolutely great to work with. They've given us great examples of other jurisdictions that have utilized this software. Um, to great effect, um, and mostly in the way of transparency to the public. And I think that's really been important to the county and to this board in particular, 
Um, so I appreciate the support of this. Um, and I think it's going to be a really great asset for us to use, not just here in the BOCC office, but countywide. We'll be able to help people understand how to use it better to communicate with the public um, and to do their own internal planning processes, which is also going to be equally valuable. So thank you for your support. When do you think we'll have the first phase of it ready to go? So we have a project scoping meeting April 8th. And okay. from that point, we'll outline what the, the rest of the year looks like. Great. Thanks for all the work on this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again for the support. It'd be a great tool for the county. Good afternoon, Commissioners. J.P. Anderson, Director of Public Health and Social Services here in Lewis County. I've got a couple of resolutions this afternoon, 21-121 and 21-122. The first is an agreement of a memorandum of understanding between Lewis County and Twin Transit. Twin Transit will be um, taking on the role of helping people to sign up for vaccination services and also providing transportation services for eligible Lewis County residents uh, to the COVID-19 um, mass vaccination sites. Um, as noted uh, in the director's update, this contract is going to be kind of time limited in that we are aligning all of our contracting work under Bird's Eye, our primary vaccine provider. And that's going to be a, a, a function of ensuring that we do this in a, in a fashion that's uh, reimbursable through the FEMA funds available for the mass vaccination work. So if there are any questions on this today, uh, happy to answer those at this time. Uh, with that one being expiring tomorrow, when do you think we'll have a new resolution with them? We will have a, a new resolution with them uh, very shortly. We had a meeting this afternoon with our incident commander through the regional IMO, and that will be uh, something that we, we got clarity on now that we can do in aligning all of these contracts through bird's eye. And so we are working on a, an amended contract right now that they will be pursuing with bird's eye for these services. So you won't see a new one, okay. but it'll go through the billing through bird's eye, the primary subcontractor through us. Thanks, JP. So JP, then Twin Transit will be going through bird's eye? Correct. Okay. All of the contracting work okay. for the mass vaccinations will be going through bird's eye. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. So similarly, uh, on resolution 21-122, this is a memorandum of understanding uh, between Lewis County and through United Way for the uh, volunteer recruitment, coordination, and supervision of these volunteers at the Lewis County-based mass vaccination clinics. Primarily, uh, these are going on at the fairgrounds, although they will also be involved with volunteer recruitment and management for the mobile clinics as they go out into the community more and more. And we'll be seeing more and more of that in the coming weeks and months um, as we work to serve people in the more rural areas and who have barriers to, to making it to our fairgrounds. Okay, I, I guess the only question I have on for both of them then is, so this is, this is, this is gonna be seamless, right? I mean, it's- Correct, yeah, no, this should not impact operations at all. Um, the fact that it's going to be going through uh, bird's eye is a mechanism that will streamline our billing process and will ensure that we're able to submit um, bills that are quickly approved. And we're happy to learn this afternoon in a conversation with DOH and the, the state FEMA response team that we can expect reimbursement for those bills in one to two weeks. And so that function uh, around aligning those contracts should support that a quick reimbursement for us and for our local providers doing this important work. Uh, if there's in kind of, I don't know, Becky, if you have anything to add to that, I think uh, the meeting that you organized this afternoon was quite helpful uh, in kind of giving us those assurances. Yeah, I think, I think they're just trying to streamline everything as, as neatly as possible to make sure the reimbursements are come back to the counties quickly. As you know, there's some significant amounts uh, with these contracts and it's important that we get reimbursed timely. So the less uh, paperwork involved or subcontracts versus subcontracts, the easier it is for everybody to receive their payment for their services. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Andy Caldwell here from Emergency Management, uh, presenting Resolution 21-123. 
And this is an extension of the local declaration of state of emergency in response to COVID-19. This extension is in effect until June 30th of this year. And this just is, so we, we have the ability to spend those emergency funds as they come in the way we need to. Are there any questions? Thank you, Andy. Thank you, sir. Okay, next one. Reappoint Ross Peterson to the Public Facilities District. Reva, did you have anything to add to this? So uh, Ross had filled out an expiring term in the past, and this just reappoints him to fill out a new term on his own. And so this one would be a four-year term expiring April 1 of 2025. Okay, thank you. C Colonel Averill raised his hand. Hmm? Colonel Averill raised his hand. Um, I'm on. What? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Make it very quick, Colonel. Okay, I just wanted to say that, that uh, as chair of the Public Facilities District Board, Ross was just appointed last year, but he was filling uh, an unexpired term. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we weren't able to appoint him for four months because of the governor's uh, edict on, uh, um, on what could be passed and not be passed. So, uh, he's just been serving on the board for a little less than a year, and uh, this gives him a full term of his own. So thank you very much for, thank for you. Uh, passing this resolution. Thank you. So now the last one we have here in 21, uh, 125, the Cirrus Hill Road closure through traffic. Through sure. Good, more, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Martin Rook from Lewis County Public Works. I'm here to speak on Resolution 21-125, which is a de uh, deliberation item. Uh, Cirrus Hill Road, a mile post 3.77 to 4.16 has been uh, damaged by a slide. Um, we found out uh, Friday morning, early bu business day. Interestingly enough, I guess it occurred Thursday night and somebody actually filmed it. Uh, I don't, I haven't wow. seen it, but uh, it's on video. Uh, so we, this resolution would be a closure of Series Hill lasting three months to evaluate the impacts on the road stability to the land side and make necessary repairs. We certainly don't want the public driving through this area until we have a better feel for what we've got. Uh, we did emergency posting on Friday. Today we're doing a uh, longer term at your discretion closure. Questions? So what's, uh, what is going to be the inconvenience for uh, drivers? Well, <clears throat> it means that everyone on, on the east side needs to go easterly and everyone on the west side needs to go westerly yeah. at this point. I don't believe that we want any traffic whatsoever across that slide. Uh, we're looking to get a, a geotechnical report, uh, and, and right now we're seeking, we'll, we'll be seeking to get rights to access the properties to do that. So, um, yeah, it, it does cause folks in that area to uh, have to detour and such. I'll let uh, Eric. So the, the inconvenience is the road's not there, uh, right. not necessarily <laughs> action by the board. So just understand that this just gives Public Works the authority to properly post the, post the, the closure um, and make sure that it's safe, that people are do understand that well ahead of getting there, that there is no road. Uh, because the road's completely gone. So uh, that is very inconvenient and Public Works will be working hard to try to remedy that problem. But in the meantime, understand that you closing, you taking the action to close it is not the inconvenient part. The inconvenient part is that your, your road's in pretty bad shape there. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a, um, if you've ever been up that road, it's a, it's a treacherous <laughs> road to begin with. So, um, you know, uh, maintaining it has always been difficult. And um, so hopefully we can find a quick solution. Well, I know you'll, your public works will get it done as quick as possible yeah, and I'm in a sure safe manner. So that's yep. the most important thing. Martin, do you know if there's any impact to the Will of Paw Hill Trail that goes at the toe of that area? I do not at this time know that. I will find that out for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? Thank you. Okay, there was a motion and a second to approve nine deliberation items, starting with resolution 21-109 and ending with 21-125.
Whoops. Just That's not true. I'm going to back up here just a little bit. It's true, but it's not true. First off, we go to the Lord's 21. 109 to 21-110 and then we go down to resolution 21 1-9 and then move it down to 21-125 there we go all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed pass thank you okay now we're going to move into the hearing uh, for this is ordinance 1324. This is prohibiting the ordinance prohibiting the possession of controlled substance, uh, counterfeit substance, and legend drugs, as well as prohibiting certain related activities and setting penalties. First, we will have a staff report followed by a question and answer period. We will then close the question and answer period and open the hearing for public testimony. Anyone wishing to testify, uh, you need to sign up or raise your hand um, because obviously we have a number of people on uh, on Zoom today. And uh, you will have three minutes. And uh, the one thing here is I know we will probably have more than a few, so let's uh, be as efficient we, as we can and please uh, honor the, the three minutes. We'll now move to the staff report. So you're... Uh, commissioners, just I almost said your honor. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> habit. Um, the ordinance has changed or the proposal has changed somewhat since it was first submitted. When it was first submitted, it was submitted as a felony. We also decided based upon feedback to provide a misdemeanor option based upon feedback from the cities. Um, we are going to take the the city portion out of it and let them deal with it on their own. And the misdemeanor option also claws back some of the um, sunset clause language, some of the felony language, things of that nature. The reason that we got rid of the sunset clause is because it's just a misdemeanor proposal and therefore it's not necessary to have it in there. Oh, Mr. Eisenberg uh, reminded me, for those on Zoom, my name is Jonathan Meyer, I'm the Lewis County prosecutor, um, <laughs> but um, it it is meant to address the Blake situation and Blake, for those that don't remember, um, struck down 50 years of drug convictions because the statute did not include the word knowingly. And so both the felony version and the non-felony version basically adds the word knowingly in there. So um, that's the short version. I, I'm anticipating a lot of comments, so I'll answer any questions that you may have right off the bat, and then we can go from there. I have a question. Grant County, they adopted a countywide ordinance. Can you tell me what what that entailed so in essence it adds the word knowingly um, and it will be a misdemeanor once it's all said and done um, not not a felony okay. and so it allows it to be handled within their district courts and um, can be addressed through that mechanism there and just so um, the board is aware the difference between felony and misdemeanor misdemeanor you can go to jail for up to 90 days for a felony, a class C felony, you can go up to, uh, you can go to prison for up to five years. However, you have to have multiple felonies before that's a possibility with drug possession. Okay. Okay, uh, any questions? Any other questions? No. Okay, I know that we're gonna have some as we move through the, as we move through the hearing. So um, we'll go ahead. Um, Okay, we'll now open the question and answer period during which the public can ask questions. This is different from the public testimony, which comes later. Now is time to ask the staff questions if anyone has any. And we'll, again, I know we'll, we'll take it uh, as, as slow as we need to, to allow people to ask questions. Are there any questions? No. Nope. Colonel Averill, do you have a question or someone? I, I think do. it's I Colonel. Have, I, okay. I do. Uh, I have a, a, a question of clarification from uh, Jonathan. So uh, essentially what you've done is uh, you've 
you've taken the incorporated areas of the county out of this resolution and uh, if they want to follow, they have to do this on their own. Is that what you're saying? The, the misdemeanor version has the incorporated areas out. And if they wanted to do something, they would have to do it in their own city limits and it would be to their own municipal court. With the only- Does, uh, this, in, does this include the uh, incorporated areas that use our district court for their municipal court? And I, yeah, I was just gonna make that clarification. So there are a couple of, of exceptions because my understanding is the sheriff's office currently patrols uh, PL and Vader. And both of those use the district court. Also, Toledo, Morton, Mossy Rock all use the district court as well. So those would still go through district court, but they're technically labeled for those purposes, a municipal court that contracts with district court. This is Eric Eisenberg. Just to clarify, Colonel, um, in order for that to be possible, those cities would still have to pass something that allowed it to occur. In other words, our county ordinance has written this way for the misdemeanor version that's online, um, only reaches unincorporated areas. It is not going to apply even in those incorporated cities that use our district court by contract, unless they pass a city ordinance that, is, that mirrors ours or something like that. Then that city ordinance, if enforced by our sheriff, could come to the county district court. Okay, that's that's very helpful to know. And and the the um, the felony versions uh, it impacts both the incorporated and unincorporated. Right? As as written, yes. But we would recommend any version, any finalized version that's going to be adopted, take that out. Uh, cities have made it clear that they don't want that in there. Okay. Um, I've got a question here so we know that the cities are not going to be included in this so as from coming from a, a law enforcement standpoint uh, do you anticipate jurisdictionally you know if there's something that takes place in unincorporated Lewis County them obviously traveling into a uh, incorporated city or uh, is that, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of all the complications. And again, I know that uh, knowing the system, not like judges and lawyers and things like that, but uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges. Uh, and again, I don't know how many challenges. Hopefully no one would uh, break the law. But at the same time, I know that there's, there's going to be challenges. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to let the sheriff speak to that if you'd like. But I also wanted to put in, because the ordinance doesn't, doesn't intend to reach incorporated areas as change. Um, well, taking a step back, both the misdemeanor version that are currently online, which does not reach incorporated areas, and the felony version, if you choose to amend it so that it doesn't reach incorporated areas, because they only talk about unincorporated areas, it would be the same area of patrol that the sheriff's office now normally patrols, um, and they wouldn't have to do anything special. To the extent that someone might be outside of a city, commit a violation in the officer's presence, and then sort of flee into the city, um, then the deputies would be permitted to pursue them into the city under uh, what's called a fresh pursuit doctrine. But they wouldn't need to especially be worried about patrolling inside the cities. They don't normally do that, and the ordinance doesn't reach that far anyway. But I'm happy again to yield if there's other information you'd like to provide, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sheriff Rob Snowza. I have uh, met with a majority of all the chiefs in the smaller communities in Lewis County, and all of them have agreed that whatever the commissioners have passed based on Prosecutor Meyer and, and Mr. Eisenberger, that they will more than likely adopt those ordinances so that they will have, they'll enforce the same. So I'm very confident that uh, the city of Morton, Mossy Rock, Toledo, Winlock and PL will adopt the same ordinances that it will be passed here. I have full confidence in that. I have talked briefly with both Chiefs uh, Couch and Chief Stenhams, and I, I believe that they will address this issue on their own accord. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Brooke Reeder. I work for Gather Church. Um, how would this 
ordinance affect harm reduction services I, when people go and exchange their needles for clean needles? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat your name, please? I apologize. Brooke Reader. Brooke. Beater. Brooke, okay, thank you, Brooke. Go ahead. How yeah. would this new ordinance affect harm reduction services as in safe needle exchange sites site, and people getting rid of their dirty needles? Short answer, it doesn't. Um, right now, Theoretically, it can be prosecuted as a as a possession of drug paraphernalia charge if they so chose. I haven't seen one of I haven't seen a needle exchange program busted. Uh, well, I've been an attorney for going on 20 years in the 20 years that I've been an attorney. Um, and that's just not something that I have seen. So it, it won't impact that at all. Thank you. OK, thank you, Brooke. Is there anyone else? Caleb Huffman. Oh. He's online. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my okay, go ahead, directed. Caleb. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Caleb. Go ahead. Great. My question is directed at the commissioner. It's just a political question, so it's not directed at the staff. Um, I know what the blank decision is, but I'm a little bit confused, or more like I'd like to know what you mean when you say we need to fix the problem of the Blake decision. What is the problem, and how does this ordinance fix it? And I know what the decision is. I just want to see, I want to make the explicit claim of what the problem is a little bit more clear. I'd like to raise a point of order. Typically, this hearing provides a mechanism for members of the public to ask the staff questions, but doesn't provide a mechanism for them to ask questions directly of the commissioners except for rhetorical ones. Um, but I mean, that's obviously up to your, uh, it's up to you commissioners about whether you wish to answer questions like that. But I just wanted to remind you that typically it is the staff who get the questions. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. So I can, that, again, this is Jonathan Meyer. The problem that Blake addressed uh, that the Supreme Court identified and overruled um, the convictions on was the statutory requirement of knowledge was not present in 6950-4013. And that's the possessory offense within the state of Washington. And because of that, the state Supreme Court determined that people that did not know they were possessing a controlled substance could be convicted of possessing a controlled substance. So for instance, if you found a shirt laying on the ground and you picked up the shirt and there was a bag of meth you could be convicted of that. Now, Washington had a um, an affirmative defense called unwitting possession, which means that they did not know it was there. But in essence, the Supreme Court found that was burden shifting and the defendant should not have to prove that they didn't know. And we should have to prove that they did know. Um, and so the proposed ordinance, either felony or misdemeanor, simply fixes that and says, if you knowingly possess a controlled substance, it's a crime. I'd like to add to that. This is Eric Eisberg again. Um, another way of looking at Blake is important to note that this is not part of some sort of fully formed legislative decision making in which the legislature or any sort of actively conscious policymaker decided how to differently tackle the social or legal problems that drug possession poses. Instead, it was a court with a much more limited focus about whether they thought it was lawful to be done in this particular way in this particular statute. So by striking that statute down, the court did not and could not have gone and taken the next step about how to fix or readdress drugs in the state of Washington. They have no power to do that and they have no right to do that. Um, that's something that is a legislative decision to be made. So I would say this proposed ordinance is something like a way of reestablishing the status quo while other ongoing efforts can be made, um, such as the legislature's current efforts to potentially look at uh, drug possession differently uh, or any future efforts we might make. So in terms of a problem, part of the problem if Blake presents a problem is that there is no plan, there is no policy about what to do differently. There's just a, a vacuum. There's just an absence of policy as the statute is stricken down with no working replacement. So. Um, 
one reason to act, and you don't have to act, you could wait for the legislature to do so, but one reason to act is that you would at least be imposing some sort of order while a solution continues to be worked out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Do we have any mm -hmm. others? Okay. Okay, we'll now close the question and answer period. Uh, would you like to have your opening statements incorporated into the hearing? Yes, yes please. Okay. Sheriff? Sheriff? Yes. Okay. We'll now open the hearing for public testimony. So at this time, uh, we have a sign-up sheet obviously over there, but at the lectern, but at the same time, uh, we will take public testimony over Zoom. Don. Good afternoon. So my name is Don Miles, and I'm from here in Chehalis. I'm a school bus driver. I've been listening both statewide and countywide the different uh, issues with with drugs and and uh, the legalization or or I don't want to say legalization, but uh, the, it, basically the ongoing arguments on how to handle um, the hard drug cases and stuff. Because of my confusion, I just figured I would tell you a little bit about my part and maybe you guys could, uh, you know, figure out where I'm coming from. A few short days ago, I celebrated 14 years clean from hard drugs. And one of the things that helped me get through that was accountability. And one of the things that I see that uh, I, I think in a lot of communities we're slacking on is holding people accountable for their actions. We're enabling in a lot of ways that we shouldn't be. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I, I honestly believe that we need to take a, a harder look at the drug crisis that we have, especially here in our community, because I will tell you it is out of control. It's reached into our schools. I have a daughter that's a senior in high school, and she she is in tears a lot of times because she tells me that there are people in her class, kids in her class, that are in her class high. They're getting high in the bathrooms. They're dealing drugs in the parking lots. They're dealing drugs off campus. And we also she also runs across a lot of kids whose parents are actively using and actively dealing. Um, there, it's it's just crazy, and I and I I can't stress enough that we need to enforce whatever drug laws that we possibly can to hold people accountable, because accountability is where it starts. It's not just it, it's not just letting them go about their way and saying it's okay. I'm not going to say it's not a disease because it is something that does lead to a disease, but it does in a lot of cases start as a choice. You can make a choice to use as I did, and you can make a choice to quit. And sometimes it's got to be that tough love and that nudge that gets that person to going the right direction. And that's what I received. I received the tough love. And when I realized I was going the wrong direction, that's when I was able to seek guidance. A lot of it was because uh, um, I went to a volunteer, it was a volunteer facility. And um, after experiencing that tough love and got that guidance, I was able to incorporate what I learned from that facility and be able to get to where I am today. Because I'll tell you, nobody ever thought I would live to be 25. And I, the 21st, I just celebrated 45. Don. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that was their three minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and thank you, Don. Thank you, Congratulations, Don. too. Thank yes, you very much. Congratulations. Uh, Tom Krause. And there's someone on the screen. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Uh, I'm Tom Krause. I live in um, unincorporated Lewis County on uh, 142 Gurrier Road. 
Uh, I'm a fire commissioner here in Lewis County Fire District 5, and I also serve on the Lewis County Board of Equalization. Now, many of you know me as a refugee from Thurston County. <laughs> we've, we've been here, Lewis County residents, for over 11 years now. And looking at what's going on in Seattle, looking what's going on in Portland, even in Olympia, we look at Lewis County like an island of sanity. Um, so my wife and I, Mary Louise, she could not be here today and she asked me to speak for her as well. We wholeheartedly support the ordinance uh, 1324 and hope that the cities will sign on to it as well. Um, I guess th that's about it. Um, we just don't want Lewis County to deteriorate now, we know what happened in Amsterdam in the 70s when the drugs were legalized, and that was a total disaster. Uh, we feel that it will draw more drug users into our county, and this would be a stop against that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Okay, and we have, uh, is it Caleb? Hi, Caleb. Yeah, my name is Caleb Huffman, and I'm a lifelong Lewis County resident, graduate of Mount Alaska High School, former Centralia College student, and I'm here to oppose a felony or misdemeanor or simple drug possession, even with knowingly added in. So a little bit about myself. One under, while an undergraduate student at the University of Washington, I wrote not one but two theses related to drugs. One as a fellow for the Center for American Politics and Public Policy. What in the political science honors Ka program? Caleb, are Caleb, I'm so sorry, yeah. but we are having a hard time hearing you. If you could please slow down just a little bit. I'll add the time I've been sure. talking back to your time. Thank you. Is it my internet? I think you're just speaking really fast and the audio <laughs> here isn't fantastic. So the combination of the two makes it difficult to follow along. Okay. My apologies. Thank, thank you. So I'm in two theses related to drugs. And I recently graduated with my Master of Law from Yangqing Academy. And this upcoming September, I'll be starting my Master of Divinity to explore what it means to be Christian and what it means to follow Jesus today. And I've been admitted and offered scholarships to Princeton, Columbia, and Duke. And I say this not to brag, but mostly so you know where I'm coming from. I'm here today because I'm inspired by my deep faith which prompts me to consider how our shared laws impact each other. So forgive, forgive this soon-to-be seminarian student's quotation of scripture in the public sphere. As the Apostle Paul, echoing the greatest commandment of Jesus, tells us in Galatians 5.14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So on the question of controlled substances and legal penalties, what does it mean to love my neighbor? I propose, well, actually, I'm commanded by my Lord to first look to the margin, or in Jesus' words, the widow, the orphan, the prisoner. And there's a direct connection to today's ordinance, as most people who, use con who abuse controlled substances are suffering from extreme trauma. And our solution is to threaten them with more trauma in prison or jail. And while this could be a form of tough love, and it, it sounds like it's worked for some people, on average, it doesn't work. Human Rights Watch calls this a disaster. Pew Research shows that more imprisonment does not reduce state drug problems. The American Civil Liberties Union calls drug prohibition a history of failure. The RAND think tank, which is funded by the Pentagon, calls criminalization of controlled substances a failure. And I could go on. In the world of social science and experts, we aren't even debating this anymore. Criminalization doesn't work for the majority. So to what end are we putting people in prison? Because in Lewis County, 200 plus people in 2019 went to jail or prison, not drug court, over drug charges. What good does this do for society? As the studies I shared indicate, nothing. This is a waste of taxpayers' dollars. So what is the loving thing to do for our neighbors who are abusing substances? Healing and treatment to address the root causes, of course. I'm not a health specialist, so I don't know the best path forward, but I can say that 
criminalization and forcing people into prison for this is not the right way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caleb. Okay, do we have anyone else? Um, I have a quick statement. My name is Brooke, and I work at uh, Gathers Med First Clinic, which is a suboxone clinic here in Centralia. I myself am in recovery, and I can state very matter-of-factly that criminalize, criminalizing it, making it a felony, a misdemeanor, whichever way you want to look at it, doesn't help the suffering addict. If we had diversion programs out there and more inpatient beds, more funding to get people into inpatient and other life skills that they can use, that would help the suffering addict. I know for me, that's what I needed. More housing, we need more housing for to help people in recovery also. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, now we'll close the hearing for public testimony. We have... Um, before we make a motion or anything, can we yep. ask Jonathan what yes, his recommendation absolutely. would be as well as uh, Sheriff Snaza? Thank you. So I've had the opportunity to uh, look at this issue. Obviously, a lot of people were caught off guard by Blake. And I agree that the state of Washington has a lot of progress that can be made in the area of uh, SUD treatment. Um, however, I am also a firm believer that the criminal justice system must play a role in that. Ideally, we're going to address these issues before someone ever becomes involved in the criminal justice system. However, statistics show us that that simply is not going to happen. Statistics also show us that if we allow people to uh, recover on their own schedule, chances are that's not going to happen. In 2013, it was estimated that 20.2 20, 20 million people were in need of treatment. Over 95% of that people of those people said they didn't need treatment. We know from just looking at our own drug court, we lost 17 people as a result of Blake. Within three days, over one half had began to, began to use again when they all said that they were going to be okay. Coerced treatment has its role. Coerced treatment, your initial motivation may not be as strong as those entering voluntary treatment. However, your initial motivation isn't the key. It's how you're coming out of treatment. And coerced treatment has been shown to be as effective, if not more effective, than um, voluntary treatment. Now, to say voluntary treatment or decriminalization is the only way to go is simply playing an experiment with people's lives. Washington has a law on the books that says if you are seeking medical help because you're in need or someone else is in need, you're not going to get in trouble. That's part of the law. So the law has attempted to remove this stigma. You can get the overdose uh, treatment basically on command, and that's available to you. The problem is there are some people who either admit they're addicts and don't want to get help, as they either destroy their lives or the lives around them. And there are others who say, I'm not an addict, as they continue to destroy their life and the lives around them. At some point in time, they're going to enter, those that enter in the criminal justice system that have SUD issues need help. Whether it's going to be voluntary, which obviously we hope it is, or if it's going to be involuntary, sometimes that's the case. Our SUD facility, while it, it does great work, you're simply not in there long enough for it to be uh, a long-term effect. When we look at the numbers of um, overdoses, I think we have to be concerned. Um, so we went from eight overdoses in Lewis County in 2019 to 32 in 2020. And we're at, I believe, three already this year. Nationwide last year, over 70,000 people died of overdoses, over 1,400 in the state of Washington. So we see what happens if we just take a wait and see approach. We see King County, that's what we see. And we don't want that. Why don't we want that? 
Well, A, because it allows people to keep hurting. Not only allows it, it encourages it to a certain extent. And we don't want that. Our job as people, as, as citizens, as healthcare providers, as commissioners, as attorneys, is to help those that need it. And I think that we have to address this. My, my goal or my hope is that the state is going to address it because I think that non-uniformity is an issue as, as Commissioner Stamper pointed out. Right now there's, I believe, seven different uh, proposed legislations that are before um, the various bodies that hopefully we're gonna reach resolution. I feel confident in speaking with um, some legislatures as well as the, the Washington Association of Prosecuting Attorneys that we're going to see something come out of this session. So my suggestion or my hope is that we come out with a resolution. My suggestion is that this board wait and see what the, the legislature is going to do because we're getting very close to the end of the session. Um, and I think that, that we can reach a universal approach. I received a letter from someone who was asking to vacate their conviction and she actually had a phone number. So I thought, what the heck? So I called her and spoke with her. And I said, hey, if you don't mind me asking a question, how do you feel about Blake? And she said, in all honesty, and I said, yeah. And she said, I think it's the wrong decision. And she said, I feel bad because I'm asking you to, to vacate my convictions. I said, don't feel bad at all. It's not your fault. But this is someone who had, whose family had sent her to treatment. And she said, the problem with voluntary treatment is it's just that it's voluntary. You sign yourself out anytime you want. She went to drug court and failed out of drug court. And she listed the day as the best day of her life was the day that JNET kicked in her door because that sent her to prison for two years. And what it took was the two years in prison and her seven-year-old daughter coming to see her when she was in prison. She goes, that coercion is what made me change. It wasn't, I'll do it when I'm ready. It was, that just opened her eyes. And she said that she, she's firmly convinced that more people will die if we simply say, yeah, personal use amount is okay. And she's currently a drug and alcohol counselor. And so when I hear stories like that, when I see families impacted by this, we can't sit around and do nothing. My goal as a prosecutor, I wanna work my way out of a job. I would love for there to be zero crime rate. However, making more and more things legal isn't the right way to do it. We have to want more for our, our citizens and the people that live here in Lewis County and live in Washington State. It's what we're called to do. So I think that the board right now should hold off. And if I were asked to recommend either the felony or the misdemeanor, I would probably lean towards the misdemeanor right now. And the reason that I say that is because it gives us more flexibility and create more of an individualized program for those that are going through. Because if it's not treated, that behavior that lands them in the criminal justice system will just get worse and worse and worse. Blake didn't all of a sudden make drugs affordable and it didn't make these folks all of a sudden able to hold down a job. So we, we need to figure out how to address this and I hope it's a statewide solution. That's it, thank you. Uh, Sheriff Snaza. Thank you, commissioners and uh, I applaud uh, Prosecutor Meyer and his staff, and, and what, what uh, Prosecutor Meyer just said, I, I agree 100%. And, I, and I've heard some of this testimony here, and, you know, we'll talk about Christian faith and stuff, and I say faith, hope, and love. Faith that something happens to an individual who gets off drugs and is baby, able to go back to some normalcy in their life. Love to love each other, to care about them, and then... You, you know, at the end of the day, um, prayers to be with those individuals, to see someone graduate from drug court. If you've seen their faces, you've looked at the children that come up to them because now they get to see their mom or dad or aunt and uncle for the first time sober. What an eye-opening experience. Unfortunately, over the last 30 years, myself, I've been involved in, a, in a, a number of incidents where I've seen drug overdoses. I've seen families affected, both life and death. And I always tell this to new deputies 
new corrections deputies and new staff, come on. If you could change one person's life, would you do it? The answer is always yes. But what if you could change one more? And I always say this. And at the sheriff's office, I truly believe that because we have been able to change people's lives. Lewis County Corrections is the largest mental health facility we have. We also treat those individuals who have drug addiction issues to help them get the start to drug recovery. You know, we say that, uh, why do we need these laws or whatever? Well, because we live in Lewis County. Lewis County is a cherished county where people come, where they can still live and enjoy, their kids go to school and raise their families in a great way and enjoy the outdoors. This is not Seattle, this is not Tacoma, this is not Olympia. All you have to do if you're a legislator is why don't you take a trip down those memory lanes of Seattle the way it used to be compared to the way it is today or Tacoma or, or even Olympia. You don't have to drive very far to see what drug addiction, homelessness, and mental health has done to our society as a whole. But I will say this, Lewis County has never given up on our people. Amen. We've never given up on the mental illness. We've never given up on those addicted to drugs, homelessness. We're always looking and continuing to find ways to help people get on this, uh, start their new life, their new journey. Because when you see that person go from that mental health issue where they're using drugs to cope with their mental illnesses to where they're able to control that and get to normalcy, those are the people that we wanna see. Those are what we're trying to do. We're trying to help. By doing nothing, that's not who we are as a community. We are those people in this community that are in this room today and those that live here strive each and every day to help those out there who are suffering addictions. And through my personal life, I've seen addictions in family and uh, I've seen others affected by it through death or whatever it is. But at the end, there is faith, hope and love that we will see at the end of the day that these people will seek recovery. And it's incumbent upon us in this room to ensure that we are doing everything we can to make that happen. And again, doing nothing is not an option in this community. I refuse that. We will continue to help one person at a time, whether it's one out of 100, one out of 50, whatever it is, that's what we need to be doing. And I believe that we can do that together in this room. We can, we can take people out of that homelessness drug addiction and, and mental health issues. So thank you. Jonathan, I've uh, got a question. Regarding that this ordinance moves through or not, do we, is there still an avenue, when I say an avenue, uh, for people to, uh, to have, uh, to get back into recovery and drug court at this point in time? So if, if we don't address it, is that what the question is? I'm saying right now, currently, we obviously are, uh, we're, uh, you know, the Blake decision has been made. So currently right now across the road, is there an avenue for, uh, for people who want us, uh, that uh, the judges can uh, enroll them in drug court? Yes. Okay. Uh, un unfortunately, it means they have to commit a felony offense. Okay. Now, even with even before Blake, that was still that was still the rule. You had to be in there on a on a felony offense. Those rules have been I don't want to say massaged, but uh, there are some people that are in there right now on non felony offenses because their felony offense went away, and they've decided they wanted to stay in there. Um, but yes, there is still a possible way. And can I get clarification from you on what you're suggesting we do is to hold off. And if the state doesn't do anything, then at that time, we're going to pick up, pick it up and do something with it. Well, that would be my suggestion. Whether you pick it up and do something obviously is going to be up to the board. But my suggestion is to me, uniformity is always um, a desirable outcome because people should be able to know where, where they are, what they're doing is legal or not legal. Okay. I mean, we, we see natural, sorry, we see natural, um, like when we go into Oregon, we know certain things in Oregon we can't do that we can do in Washington and 
and vice versa. However, when, when you get into like a state, the lines blur. Um, if you ask people from out of the area, where do you live, Centralia, where's that? Oh, Centralia, Chehalis, and then they start to figure it out. They just kind of lump it all together. And so ideally we're going to get to some type of universal state approach and it's I, I think it sounds promising that we will and i think that the approach that um seems the most likely right now will have a mix of kind of what everybody is looking for a, a non-criminal element a criminal element with a diversion with the possibility of building up to a higher form so for instance right now um you can be involved in domestic violence on more than one occasion, but eventually it becomes a felony. I wouldn't mind seeing something like that happen at the state level as far as drug possession, um, where you start out with a diversion type agreement, you go to a gross misdemeanor, and then maybe eventually up to a felony. But, you know, I don't know where we're going to end up. I just hope that we get there soon. So oh, I appreciate the care that has been brought to the table by both the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's office. It is abundantly clear to me that uh, no one here is interested in acting in haste and being inconsiderate of the real people that are affected by what goes on in this room here today. And Don, Thank you. I really appreciate your courage in speaking about your personal experience. Um, I also say that thank you to Caleb and uh, to Brooke for also providing testimony today. Um, given the fact that our legislature is still in session and there is an interest in maintaining uniformity throughout the state, um, we cause difficulties if we have differences between cities, counties, and going across uh, lines. I move that we table deliberations on ordinance 1324 until the business meeting on May 4th, 2021. Second. Okay. So a motion was made and second. Uh, just a, a couple of thoughts. Um, first off, I, uh, you know, we live in a wonderful county. And I think if our prosecutors and our sheriff, uh, the judges, the mental health experts uh, um, acted uh, with, uh, with deliberation and also uh, making sure that, that we get the information out there because many, many times, uh, most times, whenever we have hearings, uh, you know, there's sometimes uh, we don't get all the information. It's usually when we end up passing them or not passing them or moving them forward is when we get the information. So this will, uh, or feedback. So this will allow us uh, time to process this, uh, it sounds like, and it will also allow uh, our legislators to really do their job. And I know that uh, we've all been in contact with our legislators saying that we need a little bit of help here uh, so we can get this fixed. So. Uh, so one county is not pitted against another county for acting on something. Uh, and uh, we hear that quite often. Uh, you know, the rogue counties. Well, we're not a rogue county. We care about our citizens. We care about people that are in need. And we see them every day. You know, every one of our probably, we, we all have family members that's been affected by this one way or another. So we have compassion. I think we have a good roadmap to, uh, to, to process this and uh, give it some time uh, to come up with a fix that's, uh, that's real and uh, that's comprehensive. So I wanna thank everyone for being here. I thank all the comments. I thank you, Tom, uh, for, uh, for sharing. And I know that you too, like the rest of us, wanna fix on this. So uh, I think that we're gonna be working on that uh, along with the team. And that includes the prosecutor's office along with the, the county Sheriff's Department, the mental health experts, and uh, and all the uh, uh, all the people that really are uh, uh, know are the, the the resident experts on this. So, with that, there was a motion or a second. Can I, uh, to table deliberations on Ordinance thirteen twenty four until the business meeting on May fourth, twenty twenty one. Okay, I'm going through this, so you have to excuse me here. 
So I move to table this deliberation on ordinance 1324 till the business date on, what was the date again, Reba? Point of order, I believe it's already been motioned and seconded. Okay, we just okay. need I'm to just do the vote now. I'm repeating it, sorry. Okay, so what was the date again though? I wanna make sure. We will be tabling the deliberations on ordinance 1324 until the business meeting to taking place on May 4th, 2021. Okay, and the last thing I'll add to this, uh, we're gonna also, the people will be able to, to offer public comment, but we will probably not take be taking any uh, uh, formal testimony or question and answer period at that time. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye, opposed? Pass, thank you. And thank everyone. Uh, JP, do you have any, uh, uh, we've got a couple things here, I just, uh, give you a chance to talk about uh, COVID before we wrap this up? You know, I, I had talked with Eric before, and if it's okay with the board, I can I can go into the full COVID update tomorrow morning Perfect. at our director's update. Okay, so nothing to share at this time then. Okay. Um, did you want to let press? Hmm? Press? Yeah, do you have any, uh, does anyone have any questions? Claudia? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, about this decision to table the ordinance. I know that lawmakers in the legislature have expressed fear of um, a patchwork of laws, um, specifically pointing to Lewis County. And I'm wondering how much those fears and that sentiment played into your decision to at least delay this implementation. Well, I, I, I mean, you factor in everything, but I don't think it did. Uh, you know, we've been working with the prosecutors uh, we've been working with the judges and also we've been working with uh, social services. So uh, this was a decision solely based on the, the information that we received uh, from our county officials. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would just also note that when it was first introduced, the word that we were getting from the Hill was zero was going to happen this legislative session. And now there seems to be some movement. So I think that that it makes it more prudent at this time. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, it, it seemed like before the the main kind of community that you all were turning toward in crafting this resolution was law enforcement. And I'm curious how much uh, social workers and then people working um, with SUD were a part of um, conversations around crafting the ordinance. Claudia, I apologize. I didn't get to the first part of the, the question there. I said... Previously, it seemed like the law enforcement community was a large part of crafting this ordinance, or at least that the Board of County Commissioners turned to that community for guidance. And I'm wondering how much social workers and people working with substance use disorder were a part of that process and those conversations. Well, I, uh, my thoughts on it, and going to the other commissioners, when you First off, when you announce this, uh, when it's uh, as, as making sure it's it's very, making sure the public and make sure our county has, uh, we get input from everyone. You know, it's not just one, as soon as, uh, as, soon as we start the process on this, uh, you know, obviously we get a report, uh, we have our, uh, our uh, legal team look at it, but then also uh, there's a public, a public opinion out there and making sure that they have their opinions are heard and uh, they have a chance to weigh in on this uh, because we're not, you know, we're, this is what we do as commissioners. This is what I do. I listen to the people, we listen to all sides and then we make it what I call an informed decision. So it's, uh, it's, it's not complicated, but it is complicated. So you have to weigh everything out. And I, for me, I, I know that I reached out to several people in the health profession world, as well as people that had uh, contacted me directly, like a Shelly and a Caleb, um, and got their input. And, you know, it's, it's an important decision because we want to make sure that we are um, making decisions that are going to help people move forward. And I think if you listen to Sheriff Snaza, and if you've ever had an opportunity to take a tour of their facility, they are about helping people get well. Um, the, his desire isn't to institutionalize people, but literally what he said was on point with what I saw there in the sense that he wants to give 
people a second chance to, to move things forward. When you visit with the, the judges and, um, and you hear about the, the, the drug court and seeing the success of that and hearing the testimonies from that, all those things take into account. And so I think this was well thought of. Um, people spent a lot of time asking questions because in Lewis County, we do wanna help people and we wanna save the 30 people that overdosed last year that don't have an opportunity. We don't want that to play out again. And so however we can help people to stay alive and to stay a part of their families is, is what we wanna do. And I think what we're doing here is we, we want the state of Washington to move forward to help people and doing nothing isn't an option. We want to raise the bar and we don't wanna lower the bar. And so in discussing it with our citizens, with our staff, with our team, with JP, it's important, we all care about people and we wanna see people at their very best, not at their worst. Mm -hmm. I, I also wanted to ask about any concrete plans to um, boost uh, SUD treatment um, in the county. I know in weeks past there was conversation around this ordinance about, um, Prosecutor Meyer, I think this is a statement from you that uh, drug court is very high risk, high reward process and that there aren't a ton of other options for folks who, like you said, may have um, been overprescribed and have been on opiates for years and years. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if there are concrete plans going forward to boost those services so uh just briefly you're, you're right one of the and when jp was the drug court manager he can attest to this because i used to gripe at him all the time is that there's not much out there for the the low risk high need type folks and so i think that when i made my comment about leaning towards the misdemeanor because that gives us more freedom um it's because i want to get to that that more of that model where we can build something for that lower level of lower level offender where they haven't been involved in the criminal justice system as much because my goal isn't to wait for someone to get bad enough that we can then help them my goal is to start helping them sooner so that we can hopefully divert them off of that path i wanted to add something to that in terms of nuts and bolts so um, superior court does not have any supervised probation capabilities. It doesn't have probation officers. It can't supervise people. District court does have probation officers. District court sentences almost always involve things that the offender needs to go do as part of a condition of their sentence that then they turn in proof that they've done so. The probation officer checks to make sure they did it. And that is a way to try and affect meaningful change in their lives. So switching from a superior court model to a district court model via misdemeanor is a method to try to leverage more treatment resources because then the judge says, you're gonna to need to go do drug treatment. You're gonna be on supervised probation to make sure you do the treatment. The person can then go to a community treatment provider on a Medicaid coupon or on private insurance and get treatment. Unless there's anything um, you all wanted to add to that, I did have one more question. Um, I was hoping that um, Commissioner Pollock, you could elaborate on something you said in weeks prior that, and, and something that has express, been expressed by others in support of this ordinance that uh, decriminalizing drugs could Seattleize Lewis County. Um, and I was hoping you could speak more about what you meant, um, especially since in the state legislature, Seattle is also being pointed toward as um, one success in their diversion program. The LEAD program has been widely viewed as a success and has been replicated in, in cities across the country. Um, and those seem kind of like opposing messages. So the main thing that was on my mind at that point was, um, I think many of us have seen the documentary, Seattle is Dying. And that is where folks are on the streets and unable to get the help that they need. Generally, those folks are not going to be able to get help voluntarily. And I did spend a fair amount of time talking to our health providers in this area who happen to specialize in the mental health care and substance use disorder. Um, voluntary treatment doesn't help everyone. Uh, we would have been able to solve this problem long ago if that was true. Some folks need additional help 
entering the system. Um, how we do that humanely is something that we need to have extensive discussion about. And if we've got models out there, as Seattle has started with the lead, great. We want to get people into treatment. We want them to be successful. We want them to have whole, full lives after they have the bump in the road involving substance use. That's all I had. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. I have no questions. Well, you beat me to the punch, Susan. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Okay, thank you. And uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Seeing no further business, I move that we adjourn. Second. We're adjourned. Thank you, and thank everyone for being here.